misty late April morning over the heart of Coventry. And as the sun rises, below us a familiar tapestry of an iconic British staple, the allotments. These are Hursel allotments in Earlsdon, Coventry. An old site, over a hundred years old in fact, but like all urban allotments, they're caught betwixt their busy environment. To one side, a major A road, an artery leading into the city. And to its other two sides, a primary school and playing field and a Victorian terraced road. Plenty of horticulture to be seen, lots in neat little rows, others not so. But to every allotment here, this is their piece of green heaven, an escape from the rat race of the city. This was once an ancient orchard, and some of the very mature fruiting trees are still about. But let's get our feet on the ground, and by the sounds of it, some of the allotment tiers are already hard at work. A speckled wood butterfly, fresh from overwintering in the garden shed, soaking up the first rays of the warm spring sunshine. That's it. This won't get the baby a bonnet. This won't get the baby a bonnet, will it, Dill? A call to arms no. as people set about Push their day. Table. But I'm here to meet a particular lady, a lady mature in her years. She's a six-year-old vixen. She's well known around the allotment site. In fact, so well known, they've christened her. She is known to everybody as Frankie. It's a big day for Frankie. She's a little anxious and her swollen teats might give you a clue. She's just had her fourth litter of cubs and today is the first day she reveals them to the world. Often taking to compost heaps to soothe her sore teats. Two cubs appear. Sadly her original litter numbered three, but a day previously one of the cubs had left independently early from the den and found itself in a water butt. Despite Frankie's best efforts, she couldn't save it. She and these cubs have just spent the last five weeks down in the den not seeing any part of the allotments. Them surviving on her milk and her surviving from food provided by the dog fox. But having two new cubs left me with a quandary. I needed to christen every fox on the site. So I looked at the delta marks, the black marks on the muzzles and one was smudgy and one appeared to have a little dash. So not very originally I christened them smudge and dash.
Allotment life carried on throughout the day and it was just about the time I was due to pack up when I met the fourth member of our Fox family. A striking one-year-old vixen. Because of the rich colour of her fur, I christened her Whiskey. Whiskey is actually Frankie's daughter from last year. And it's not uncommon for non-breeding males and females to stay with family and act as aunties, uncles, nannies. I returned two days later and I knew that today would be my last day on the allotment for ten weeks. Spring blossom high in the fruit trees and soon I met a familiar face, Smudge. And Smudge was eating toast. Whether stolen or donated, it told me that this little cub was weaned and onto solids. Of course wherever Smudge would be, surely the sibling would be nearby and Dash was soon to make an appearance. Watching the play that ensued was thrilling. A vital part of these little cubs lives as they learn about the abilities of their bodies for a life as a predator ahead. This play though and the lack of dignity afforded by it let me identify the gender of these two cubs both were female. Frankie had two young daughters. And despite it being a simple joy, watching this freedom, I did fear for Frankie's welfare. At six, she's three times the age of an average urban fox. And this is an exhaustive process. I wondered how she would cope. But I knew that on my return in ten weeks time, Smudge and Dash were going to look like completely different foxes. And sure enough, in mid-July, Smudge was altogether a sub-adult. Lots had happened in my absence. Battle lines had been drawn by the allotmenteers against the usual nemesis, the garden slug. And of course the snail. But I'm glad to say they felt as if they were winning the battle. It was then I was to meet the fifth and final member of our fox family. Stockier, darker and very masculine looking, this was the dog fox, Dad. Thankfully he had a neat little spot on his muzzle. And so I christened him such. Spot, the dog fox. With the cubs now sub-adults, Spot was becoming a little more aloof. His role as a responsible parent was becoming less crucial. And due to this, he would often stay away from the territory for a few days at a time. And this was his return after a whole week 
away from the allotments. The first of the crops being harvested and being mid-July it had to be new potatoes. Hastily bagged for supper. Dash could smell her dad's return. And she greeted him at the entry of the nursery den. But Spock had something else on his mind. Here, amongst the potato flowers, he'd cached away some food. Caching is where foxes bury food for later. And this had been left there all week. Both the sisters now making an appearance and realising that food was at hand. They were keen to have their share. But Spot was away quickly. With what looks like a young hedgehog. A hoglet. As initially distressing as this may appear, it was good to see that the foxes were being natural predators as well as surviving on handouts. A lesson learnt, certainly, for the cubs. That food just beneath their muzzles for the whole week, and they didn't know. Despite this active predation, these foxes are certainly not the biggest predators on the allotments. That goes to a very much more familiar mammal. The domestic cat. There are eight territories of domestic cats here at Hersel Allotments. And you can be quite sure that what they predate is much vaster in quantity than our fox family. But in my absence, there was worrying news about Frankie. She hadn't been seen for two days, and I found her, eventually, curled up and resting at the back of the allotment site. She looked weak, and she hadn't appeared to be eating well. The omens didn't seem to be too good. Down in the old greenhouse, as old as the allotments themselves, the first of the fruit was ripening. It appeared that this was going to be a bumper year, and new shoots were being taken already to try and maximise the crop. It was then that I met Marcus. Marcus had had a plot on the allotments for well over 30 years. But right now, he was lost. For the last five years, Marcus had had a regular dinner date with his fox. But for the last two days, she'd not made an appearance. He hadn't known this happened before and he really didn't know where to put himself or what to think. Marcus did though have a claim to fame. Back in 1975 on Huey Green's Opportunity Knox, he came second in the grand final. He was part of the Tropical Harmony Steel Band and they lost to Tom O'Connor. Such glories and our distant memories for Marcus. I wonder what the bloody hell she is. Where she is. All that he cares about right now is where is his darling Frankie. He still prepares her lunchtime meal, 
today, last night's leg of pork. But he's inconsolable. Terrible, man. Oh, I really felt for him. Really, where is she gone? It was now that I realised the depths of the sincerity of these relationships that people had with our Fox family. He went to fetch some photos of Frankie to try and appease his anxieties, but it didn't really work. It's not like she. She usually come regular on a regular basis. Sometimes she late, but she does come. Two days now I'm looking for this bloody fox and I don't know where she is. I can't, I can't believe this. Marcus, without his Frankie, was a lost soul. It was a further week before I returned to the allotments, and I arrived early to make up for some lost time. Initially I headed down to the site of the nursery den and on my arrival I found a fox, but a new fox, a stranger and not a member of our family. This was a young vixen, clearly without a litter of cubs and most probably a territory too. Unusually she had a black tip to her tail where normally a fox is, is white. And so I christened her Black Tip. As a nomadic female, and clearly a brazen one at that, and thinking of the fragility of Frankie right now, Black Tip could well be a risk to the integrity of our family. It's not usual for a strange fox to cut through the heart of a territory bang in the middle of the day. Clearly there should be a response, and normally this would be from the alpha female, but she didn't appear. Spot though soon found black tip scent, and marked his own. I assume he went off to see if he could locate the stranger. He was shortly followed by Whiskey, who too sent Marked the site, and, as with Spot, followed in her tracks. That afternoon was to be a wonderful, joyous occasion, with all allotment tears gathering up their first harvest of broad beans. Lots of chat and laughter, and all fueled by plenty of cups of tea. It was also a big day for Dylan the dog. Dylan was a Staffordshire Bull Terrier with a penchant for broad beans. Could he resist at what was hanging tantalisingly above him and just out of reach, but now on the floor in a basket? 
clearly not. It was also a big day for our two cubs. Both the girls seemed to found a penchant for the copse, a small piece of woodland attached to the allotments. And in the copse, and in fact all around, today was a day of flying ants. A surprise at first, but then a great adversary to hunt. Later that afternoon and heading into early evening, Blacktip returned. Spot was immediately on her scent. In fact, unbeknown to him, she was just at the rear of the allotments. And then at the nursery den, a fox with a slightly kinked tail. This was Frankie. She sent Marked and moved to plot 23, where Blacktip still remained. Blacktip makes an approach. She yelps a contact call. But Frankie returns with vigour, and a fight ensues. Frankie takes a nasty nip to her snout, but she overawes the inexperienced and immature Blacktip, who's left cowering. She tries to make good an escape, but only into the path of Spot. At last, Frankie has appeared. And the following day, a certain gentleman felt the presence of something very familiar. Not wanting to overawe Frankie, after two weeks of not seeing her, Marcus retreated to the caravan. Soon she could be seen lying in the shadows of the greenhouse. This was too much for Marcus. He approached and offered Frankie some food, trying to remind her of the relationship they had for the previous five years. Unsure at first and appearing a little anxious and sporting some nasty scabs to her snout from the previous night's fight with Blacktip, it wasn't long before Frankie realised that this was a familiar situation. And she thankfully accepted the offering. Marcus, of course, was over the moon. He got his darling Frankie back. With a taste of chicken too tempting, she returned soon. Magpies waiting for any tidbits or scraps. and what couldn't be yet on the day was taken to be cashed.
into August now and the temperatures are soaring. And some of the blooms around the allotment site are still yet to be pollinated. But thankfully to the heart of the allotments there are two very active beehives. All of these worker bees are female and they have very short lives of only eight weeks. Every day of this short life will be out searching for blooms. They could travel as far as 60 to 70 miles, investigating well over a hundred flowers. Searching for sweet nectar, this bee arches its back, pushing through the holes to the rear. But as she does so, she takes a good dose of pollen. And off then to find another pumpkin flower. In their short lives, these bees will only make one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. That's twelve bees for every finger in the honey pot. Back on plot 23, the plot where Frankie had had her altercation with Black Tip, we meet the resident keepers Molly and Graham. Frankie is very familiar with this plot and with Molly and Graham. In fact, it could be said she might be over familiar. But she knows that often Molly and Graham will leave her retreat, although this is only ever done once the work is completed. On leaving the plot, Frankie returns. And Molly has left a treat, but she's decided to provide a challenge for Frankie. A lovely piece of rump steak. 12 foot up the fruiting tree just behind her. First of all, she needs to catch the scent. The fox's sense of smell is infinitesimally better than ours, and it isn't long before Frankie catches a good whiff of the steak above her. The question remains though, can she retrieve it? It appears that Frankie is back to full fettle. Whilst topping up bird feeders, Pete has spilt some seed. Too much of a temptation for one of the smaller inhabitants of these allotments. Bright supermoon and a tawny owl calls. There are murmurings from below.
a small whiskered face appears. A rat. The rats on the allotment site appear to have a much healthier diet than those we would assume in the more built up areas. Here they get by with predominantly fruit and seed. Just about the same time, a more familiar mammal enters plot 23. And with the fruit falling in late August, this was a lucky escape. In the very early morning at first light, we find our two cubs, Smudge and Ash, playing much like they did at five weeks old. It appears that the dominance of Smudge continues, with Dash always seemingly ending up on her back. But they need to be careful now, as sub-adults, that this play doesn't cause injury. It won't be too long before they're leaving the territory to start a life of their own, and having an injury could jeopardise their chance of survival. With a very hot early sunrise, the morning dew soon evaporates. Smudge still on plot 23, and still it appears playing her games. But down in the copse in this first light, Dash, it appears, has inevitably been injured. She has a nasty limp to her rear right leg. We would expect these cubs to be on the allotment site for a few weeks yet, so hopefully she'll fix herself. If you are here this early, an August morning, in fact any morning of the year, you'll find John. John is one of the oldest inhabitants of the allotment site. He arrives early because John has a breakfast date on, and one he's kept for well over 20 years. Twenty generations of robins have become very familiar with John and his offerings. In fact so familiar, they're often found inside his shed. John reliably informs me that in colder climes during the winter, they'll predominate inside. As he puts on his burner for his first cup of tea, they'll sit, getting warm, as he feeds them biscuits. It can't and mustn't be ignored, the effect that this has to John's health and well-being. His serotonin goes through the roof every morning, and no amount of medication or pills could ever do that. In his 90s, these robins give John a reason to be, a raison d'etre, priceless. The tatty appearance of these little robins is down to this being the month of August, and most small birds and passerines have their molt during this period. Thank 
close to rubbings. August continues apace and it isn't long before we're on the cusp of September. The first of the acorns being gathered by the usual suspects a very refined form of caching by this grey squirrel, meticulous in every way. And within the copse, in a sunken bathtub, we find a small pond, resplendent with common frogs. But underneath the water, it's a whole new world. A galaxy of pink blobs, no more than three millimetres across. It's only when you look under a microscope you can see the incredible form of these creatures. These are Daphne, or water flea. Not actually fleas, but small freshwater crustaceans. Nearly transparent bodies and a small beating heart, and simple eyes that just see light and shade. These invertebrates survive solely on rotting vegetation. Thankfully, they're not on the frog's diet, so the two happily coexist. September begins and the days are still warm and with a week or so left yet before we return to school small children like Thomas can explore and find their first fox den. Mr Fox hears him but Spot right now is busy with his daughter Smudge exploring the hedgerows and the first signs of fruit Talking of fruit, as thought, it's been a bumper year. Every tree laden and people busying themselves, harvesting their crops. The second generation of speckled wood are on the wing. This then the butterfly that will return to the garden shed in the next few months. The last of the water taken from the water butts. And even here we find life, back swimmers, cruising the surface. Down at the nursery den we find Dash, clearly gnawing at her hip where she took an injury but now moving well.
and under the care of her nanny, Whiskey. It has to be said that Smudge and Dash are taking now to the cops and calling it their own. This being a sign that soon they'll be off. Whiskey, though, is a fully signed up member of the family. And this being the end of the week, she knows that Molly will soon return to her plot and give them a weekly evening treat. Dash, on the other hand, takes herself to the cops. Whilst Whiskey negotiates her route to plot 23. And closely followed by her mum, Frankie. And then Smudge takes herself to the cops. And this, this moment, was the last I was to see of either of them. That night, they both left the territory to start a life of their own. Both Whiskey and Frankie now waiting in the wings, Molly returns, and she gives a familiar call and a whistle to tell them she's arrived. Soon they make their move, but unusually, today sees Whiskey take the advantage. Normally, being the subordinate to Frankie, she waits her turn. But today, that's not the case. And I wonder if this is significant. Still a relatively shy fox, Whiskey takes what she needs and retreats. Frankie, on the other hand, very familiar with Molly, comes that little bit closer and stays a little while longer. Feeling that my time at the allotments was coming to a close, myself and Molly discussed the life of Frankie over the last six months. It had been a tumultuous affair and we thought there in July that maybe she wouldn't make it. But she did. She pulled through. All her maturity and years of experience saw her through the bad patch and come back just at the right time in defence of her family. And now here she is on the cusp of autumn, approaching the winter breeding season. And we wonder, 
Is it possible for her to enter her seventh year and have a fifth litter of cubs? Just as we consider this, who should turn up in the neighbouring plot? Spot, resplendent in his full winter coat. A very handsome chap. One thing can be said if you're a fox here at Hersel Malamans. You're surrounded by friends. In a world that possibly doesn't necessarily see foxes for what they actually are. Family orientated, intelligent, wonderful creatures to behold. As the sun sets and the cold light of the evening hits, maybe this draws out some reality in the conversation that Molly and I are having. In all probability, it would be almost unheard of for Frankie to enter yet another year and have yet another litter of cubs. But whatever was to happen to her in the autumn of her life, it can be most definitely said that no fox far or wide is as loved by so many as she. And with that, she leaves through the hedge to her mate spot. The last time I was ever to see her. <laughs>